Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And for today's lecture, we're in Gen Bio, we're going to talk about Charles Darwin <clears throat> and um, his contributions to the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Um, first, I just want to talk a little bit about Darwin as an individual um, and kind of provide some insights into you know the life style life um, of Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin was born in what you could say wealthy. And his family was well to do. His dad was a physician, his grandfather was a physician, and ultimately Charles Darwin was meant to be a physician. And um, during, at least according to Charles Darwin's father, that individuals who were well-to-do and um, grew up during this time period, there were two jobs at which individuals should be doing. You could either be a physician and work in the medical field as a doctor, or you could be a clergyman and you could work as a religious individual. And to Charles Darwin's father, these were the two options that Darwin had. Darwin was uh, less than an A student, per se. So Darwin had um, a problem, I guess you could say, with uh, sitting through class or paying attention. He he wanted to be outside. He was really um, one of those individuals that loved to be in nature, loved to be outside, loved you know to be away from the classroom, away from other people, and just doing his own thing. And so he didn't take his studies very serious, but nonetheless, he was good enough that he entered med school. Um, but quickly realized that med school was not for him. Now you have to remember, we're talking about medicine in the 1800s. We're talking about a time period around 1830 or so. Um, anesthesia isn't really developed, um, and medical procedures were pretty brutal. So when he was in med school, um, he would see individuals get amputations and things like that without any anesthesia so the individuals would basically scream themselves until, scream until they passed out and Darwin didn't really actually enjoy the sight of blood <clears throat> he didn't enjoy screaming, he didn't enjoy physical pain to people so Darwin quickly realized that being a physician um, or a doctor it was not the life for him so he dropped out and he stopped going to med school. So his dad said his other choice was to be a clergyman. And so he entered school to be a clergyman and he found it a lot more pleasing to him in the sense that in the 1800s, most religious individuals, I shouldn't say most, a lot of religious individuals they would, you know, be the voice to pass on the religion, but they also were there to collect and catalog all God's creations according to the time period. So their job was to go out and look at insects and name the insects and collect the insects and the plants and other animals and, and study nature. And Charles Darwin loved this. This was this was right up his alley and, and kind of the thing that he wanted to do with his life. So while he was going to school, he spent most of his time collecting insects and doing research um, and uh, not really concentrating on the religious piece of schooling, but rather the naturalist piece of schooling. And um, then he was asked uh, to go on 
the Beagle, the HMS Beagle, by Fitzroy. And uh, he was not the first choice. Um, he, he was far down the list. But that's because Fitzroy said that the, the trip that he had planned would only take two years, and most uh, naturalists at the time who had already been on, on you know, voyages, they knew that that was not going to be the case, that it was going to take far more than two years, and a lot of the naturalists that Fitzroy were asking, they already had families and children and things like that, or um, other jobs and things like that. So, uh, most of them turned him down. Well, all of them turned him down until he got to Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin was asked, um, and at first his father said no, because Charles Darwin had to pay his own way. And so he had to cough up the money to go on the voyage. And Charles' father said no, that he couldn't go unless he found someone <clears throat> that was um, well respected that thinks he should go that thinks this would be a good idea for him to go on this voyage so he went to his father-in-law which also happens to be his great uncle I think um, or maybe just his uncle I'm not entirely, his uncle I believe sorry um, and asked him um, if he would vouch for Charles Darwin going on this trip. Okay. And yeah, he did. And he told uh, Charles Darwin's father that he should go on the trip. And so they, they forked out the money and Charles Darwin went on the HMS Beagle, on the voyage of the Beagle. Okay. Now, when I say uncle, um, <clears throat> Charles Darwin married his first cousin, Emma Darwin. And, you know, he regretted this, not because he didn't love his wife, he loved his wife, but he didn't know, and at the time, it was very common for people who were wealthy to marry within the family, um, to keep the wealth in the family, but at the time, he didn't know what the consequences of inbreeding was, and no one did. But Charles Darwin, because he studied everything, including his own children, he later wrote in a lot of his diaries and things like that that the illnesses that his children, some of his children have, were due to him inbreeding, him breeding within the family. Okay? And so he realized that there was something called the inbreeding depression and that <clears throat> you can get an overabundance of same things like recessive genes that can cause um, problems in, in your offspring or in the children. Okay? And Charles Darwin realized this. Okay, So from there, we're going to start talking about the Voyage of the Beagle and some of the other things. I just want to kind of give you a brief um, kind of background into Charles Darwin, the man. Okay, so <clears throat> Charles Darwin, he was born in 1809 and died in 1882. Um, he's most famous for his work with evolution um, and a lot of people think that he invented evolution but he didn't even coin the term evolution in fact he didn't even coin the term natural selection uh, natural selection is a term that was used by Alfred Russell Wallace which we'll talk about later and evolution is an old term it was used way before Charles Darwin even his grandfather as writings in, in which he uses the term evolution. So um, Charles Darwin, what he did was he developed a mechanism or came up with a mechanism for a mechanism for how evolution can occur. Actually, he came up with three mechanisms, but the most famous one is natural selection. And so it's not that he invented evolution. He is known as the father of evolution. But um, it's because of this mechanism, this means by which evolution can occur, that Darwin's most famous for. Okay. He published that mechanism in 1859 um, in, a, in a book called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And as I've stated before, this is not my favorite book. Um, 
other people, other scientists really like this book. I find, I find this his worst book of all. Um, it's extremely boring, and um, The Voyage of a Beagle is much better. Uh, the Emotion of Man is a much better book. There's a lot of other books that Dar I think Darwin did a much better job at. I think this one is, is fairly dry, <clears throat> boring, and I'm not, uh, you know, it's not my favorite. But nonetheless, he published it in 1859. Um, after, you know, waiting about 16 years, or sitting on it for about 16 years, and we'll come back to that. Okay. So Darwin's work, his book that he published, um, *The Evolution by Means of Natural Selection*, it really challenged the views of the of the world. Um, when it was released, it was either met with scientific approval or massive amount of controversy. <clears throat> and it's really because no one had put forth a explanation for how things could change. A lot of scientists to this point, um, into the 1800s, they knew that species were not stagnant. They, they did change, but they didn't know how. And they, they didn't have a good explanation for it. Um, and Charles Darwin came up with that explanation. And so it really challenged the world's views. So then, like I said before, he proposed the mechanism for evolutionary change called natural selection. He also proposed two other mechanisms, artificial selection and sexual selection, which we'll talk about um, later when we talk more about how evolution works. Okay? We're going to concentrate mainly on natural selection today. It started off like <clears throat> all the theories that we've talked about before, cell theory, germ theory, um, Mendelian genetic theory, theory of heredity. All these um, theories all started off just like Charles Darwin's theory of evolution with a hypothesis. And, and so Charles Darwin put forth a hypothesis on how species can change. And then it, he compiled a massive amount of research. Charles Darwin was a excellent letter writer. Okay? So he wrote letters to many, many people all over the world, scientists in general, okay? but also individuals that um, bred pigeons, individuals that bred horses, cattle. Uh, if if he could get any information from someone that would allow for him to build on his hypothesis for natural selection, then he did so. And he wrote lots and lots of letters. I mean, some estimates of, you know, five to ten letters every single day he wrote to people all over the world. <coughs> after much testing, after years, 50 years, 75 years of work, um, Darwin's hypothesis for evolutionary change was raised to what we call the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Alright, so how did it come about? How, how did the information come about? It really started with the voyage of the Beagle. And, and so Darwin went on the HMS Beagle and he started his trip in 1831 and Fitzroy said it was going to take two years but instead it really took five and they ended in 1836. The purpose of the HMS Beagle's voyage was to map the world's coastlines. So the goal was to map all the continents and all the coastlines and you know, find out where the ports were, find out what, you know, what were the natives like, could you trade with them, and really it was, the goal was to allow for England and Europe to maybe expand to different parts of the world. <clears throat> but along this trip, and the reason why Darwin's on the trip is because Fitzroy wanted a someone to talk to mainly. So Fitzroy is running, he's the captain of the ship, and at the time 
you know, as a captain, you don't really talk to the slaves that are doing all the work on the ship, but you want a companion. And so that's part of the reason why Darwin um, went on the trip is because Fitzroy needed a companion. But the other piece is most trips like this, uh, a naturalist was hired or was brought onto the ship so they could document the natural world. And that's the animals, the plants, even the geology and geography of the natural world. So Darwin, when they would go to port, he would get off the ship and he would go out and he would catalog all the different species that he saw. And then he named lots of them, but he would catalog them, send them back um, to England and, and, uh, and whatnot. And so while doing this, though, he noticed that animals and plants differed based on differing environments. Right? And as you moved across the landscape, moved up a mountain, down a mountain, different localities had different plants and different animals. It was this original observations that kind of led Darwin to hypothesize that species were not fixed, that species could change. And um, so then throughout the rest of his voyage, so this is early on, throughout the rest of his voyage, his goal really was to catalog everything and continuously think about how species are changing um, through these different environments. So here you can see the five-year voyage of the Beagle. Okay, start in England and come down. Um, most of the time of the voyage was spent in South America. Um, they were at the two-year mark by the time they made it to the Cape of Corn. Okay, so they are already two years in, and they hadn't even done. Uh, they hadn't even collected all the data on South America. Okay, the piece of the voyage that Darwin's most famous for is the Galapagos Islands and um, the interesting fact about that is Darwin really only spent about 30 days in the Galapagos Islands. He didn't make it to all the islands even um, so he didn't even visit all the islands and he hated the Galapagos Islands. Um, he, he didn't enjoy the islands at all because you know some islands are very rugged. They're desert habitats, things like that lots of sharp rocks. Um, others are more inhabitable and more tropical, but nonetheless Darwin didn't really enjoy his time in the Galapagos. Plus probably by this time he was pretty seasick and Darwin had um, a problem with being seasick the entire voyage. It could be because he had Chagas disease, we don't know. We think that, some scientists think, that Charles Darwin around Valparosa, he picked up and got bit um, by a bug, a true bug, an infestatum, that caused him to develop Chagas disease. Um, we don't know this for a fact, but his um, his illness that proceeded when he got back home to England. Um, the illness that preceded was very similar to what we'd expect if someone had Chagas disease. Okay. So nonetheless, it probably wouldn't have in, it set in yet, but he had been bit by many bugs, many mosquitoes. Hey, he was also seasick, etc. So it could have been that when he made it to the Galapagos Islands, he was just tired of the trip. I mean, it had already been over two years by the time he got there. Uh, and then you can see that even Fitzroy was pretty tired of the voyage um, because there's very few stops after the Galapagos Islands. They, they didn't go very, they didn't even map Australia, they didn't make it to New Zealand, they didn't go to Indonesia, India, they didn't even map Africa, they just came right back um, as pretty much as fast as they could, which still took a little over two and a half years. <clears throat> All right, so along the voyage, Darwin made quite a few observations that made him rethink the current belief that species are fixed. 
first of all, he noticed that there were fossil organisms, so fossils of extinct organisms, but those extinct organisms resembled living organisms. So there's a good passage in The Voyage of the Beagle where Darwin's talking about sitting next to a river, looking across the river and seeing in the you know cut bank of the river, he can see this giant fossil of a Galophodont, which is like an, an extinct armadillo, big armadillo. And above it, running on the bank, running on the surface, is modern armadillos, small armadillos. And so Darwin, you know, he he made a lot of these observations. Uh, he made he found an extinct giant ground sloth in the same region which he found um, living th or two-toed sloths. And so he he had already observed fossils in regions where living organisms were, and they resembled each other. And it might have been one might have been giant, one might have been small, but the resemblance was still there. Okay, so that fossil evidence really was weighing on him. Okay. The second piece was as he was progressing, remember he started at the you know equator basically in South America and then worked his way all the way down to the tip and then back around. And so as he's moving through habitat, he saw that organisms change. So as you know, you move from forested habitat to grasslands to more desert habitat, you get changes in not just plants, but you change animal life. Okay? And that in between, in the transition pieces, he also saw different organisms that could transition between two habitats. Okay? And so this, the living organisms plus the geographical patterns that really provided them some evidence and then finally, it was the islands. Okay. The islands were so different than the mainlands, yet so similar. In that Darwin had seen finches on the mainland. He had seen cormorants on the mainland. He had seen iguanas on the mainland. But then when he made it to the islands, and the cormorants can't fly. They're flightless. And the marine iguana, or the iguanas were marine could swim down and, and eat algae off the bottom. And the finches were, you know, at least some, were very different than the mainland finches. He noticed that, you know, the animals and the plants are, are different than the mainland, but yet they're related to each other, or they look like they're related to each other. Okay, so here is an example of that Galapagos okay, next to an armadillo, and Darwin found many fossils of this. So from the Finch work, Darwin was concentrating on, you know, collecting organisms. And he really didn't even know that these organisms were finches. Um, actually, he didn't think they were finches. He thought some of them were woodpeckers, some were warblers, some were sparrows. He just he didn't know because he wasn't a he's not an ornithologist, so he really didn't know what the birds were. So he shot them all, and he sent them back for identification. Right? And it wasn't until later that they're all identified as being finches. And um, from that information, then Charles Darwin came up with one of his most famous quotes, and that is descent with modification, which is sometimes used to describe like parents giving birth to offspring, but that's not what Darwin attended it to be. Darwin was talking about ancestors. Ancestors being, you know, either a, a living ancestor or an extinct ancestor. And that as time progresses, that that ancestor would give rise to different modifications and organisms would be modified to a different environment. But they would still share that common ancestor. And for example, all the finches would, must have a common ancestor on the mainland, okay? which would be some type of finch that gave rise to all the varieties of the finches on the Galapagos Island. 
This is what Darwin was talking about when he was talking about descent with modification. So <clears throat> another piece that really kind of gave Darwin this insight that species are not fixed came through Thomas Malthus's book, the essay on the principles of population. This book is about human populations, and it's actually about mainly about over-reproduction of humans and the fact that humans have the capability of out-reproducing their food source. So they can reproduce faster than their food source, and therefore famine and diseases and starvation will increase when this occurs. So Darwin read this book and, and took a lot of insight from the book. And so the book, like I said before, is really concentrating on human populations and the fact that human populations, at least in the 1700s, were increasing geometrically. While the food that humans were consuming was increasing arithmetic. So what you get is geometric progression of one population, but the food population is arithmetically progressing. So it's progressing in equal amounts year after year, while geometric progression is by some fold increase, right? some um, value. <clears throat> and so Malthus's book was really about what occurs and what point so how big does this gap have to be? Okay. But what occurs when this gap gets wider and wider? Okay. What happens to the resources? What happens to the populations? So Darwin took that, and he took it a step further. He explained that it's not just human populations, but all organisms have the capacity to over-reproduce. Okay. All organisms reproduce more than is needed. And that something, in this case, na nature, is selecting for organisms that are best suited for the new environment. So some organisms do not persist um, or survive into the next generation. Okay? And so Malthus's book, when it, when it came out, was about human populations, but Darwin noticed, like, look, it doesn't matter if we're talking about birds or insects or fish, they all reproduce more offspring than is needed to maintain the same population size. And that's where Darwin started to generate his ideas about, well, what determines whether or not an offspring will survive. That survivorship or that survivability has to do with, it depends on the situation, but it could be a physical trait or physical traits, behavioral traits, it could be physiological traits. There's lots of attributes, lots of things that can be associated whether or not an organism will survive. Surviving isn't the only thing that it has to do. It then has to be able to pass on its favorable characteristics to the next generation, to its own offspring. Darwin then suggested that if these organisms have favorable characteristics and they're going to pass them to their offspring, and those offspring are going to have favorable characteristics that eventually the number of favorable characteristics will increase in the population and then therefore any characteristic that is not considered favorable will be selected against and this is the way natural selection would work. So favorable characteristics are going to become more prevalent in a population and less favorable characteristics are going to um, fall out of the population. And then Darwin suggested, well, how these characteristics are determined, or what characteristics are determined to be favorable, is dependent on the environment. 
if the, in one environment a series of characteristics might be favorable, and in another environment a whole different series of characteristics could be available, or could be um, valuable or favorable. And that means that survivability is determined by particular environments. In other words, organisms are suited for one environment might not be suited for another environment. Okay? And so with that, we're going to move now into talking about natural selection and the ways at which um, nature does the selecting. Okay, So we're going to talk about survival of the fittest and what fitness is. It's not what you think it is. It's not how fast you can run or how high you can jump necessarily. It depends. Okay? But it's rather how many, how much material, how many fair, favorable characteristics are you passing on to the next generation. Okay? So we'll come back and we'll talk about natural selection and what Darwin intended natural selection to mean and, you know, in some cases what other people have taken natural selection and twisted it to be. Okay? Till next time.